Hello, everybody. This lesson is to entice you to watch a two-hour lesson where I fully explain everything that I'm going to gloss over in this lesson where I try to explain intervals. Well, I'm not going to try to explain intervals. I'm just going to show you um, what our lesson is involved in five minutes or less. So intervals in five minutes or less. So here at the top of the screen, you're going to see a list of the intervals from root to shining root here, um, all 12 of them. And we're going to see, hey, we have a pattern here about how they lay out on the fretboard. And then we're going to show you how they ultimately lay out on the guitar fretboard. And then we're going to hear them too, since my guitar is plugged in. So um, starting out, we have this um, bunch of lines scribbled on this diagram here. They're going to go away on the next page. But just to show you like in groupings, this is our chord cluster, our interval cluster on the guitar fretboard. No matter where I move, uh, my design, my desired root, so I could be on the A, right here, I could be here. Now I'm not going to get too close to this G and B string shift because that does screw up this pattern. But for the most part, this is the pattern. You have the sevenths here, the threes here, the fours from this root, the five, flat five I mean, the four and the five are together, the twos, and the sixes, flat six, regular six, or sometimes sharp five, or most designations sharp five. Okay, so that stays the same, and that's going to help us um, find out where these interval shapes are on the fretboard and how to always remember them. So um, interval number one, the flat two, sounds like this. And here are some places you can play it with an open string. You can play it like this. Take note of how it makes a square. That's very important for fretboard navigation. And here you want to know a far away interval for chord situations. Doesn't sound that good in a chord because this is more of a step in a melody. And it's very, very important in the major scale because it's more tense than the other step of music, which is the basically the simplest other notes to grab, which are either basically one note away or two notes away. Okay, so um, the major two, another step, sounds like this. The minor two sounded like this. Jaws warning more tension. The regular two releases the tension. But if we had a scale that was all, all of these st easy steps. Sounds kind of ambiguous and sort of strange and it's called the whole tone scale and it has its purposes here and there but um that's it that is a major scale i'm sorry a major interval a major step interval and um you want to know it uh down here as far as uh chord shapes go you'd want to play it like this if you were looking for it to think about is a note involved in a chord moving on we have the flat third very popular very common very notorious this is how you play it we're not going to go too much into about it or else this video will start getting as long as the other one but there is a ton of important things probably the one of the most important interval groups um in this series is these thirds and when i say groups you'll notice that there um seems to be these pairs of notes like flat two and two are together because those are the steps in the scale, the general steps. Uh, flat three and three are more leaps. You start to, as you now have to jump farther and farther away from the root, these are sounding more like leaps and are better for chords. And funny, we should say that, that these are probably the two most important notes just about for nearly any chord, um, any majorly popularly played chord, but you do not need them in a chord. You could omit these and have what is known as suspended chords. You've suspended the use of a third. So the minor third has its minor sound. It's going to be 
generally played like this. When you're playing a pentatonic scale, it's also going to be played like this. When you're playing arpeggios, you might... And the important thing to know is this one does cross since we cross uh, this interval leaps onto another string. Then it becomes important to understand our G and B string relationship and how it changes it to look like what's going to be coming up as a major interval. So remember, minor does look like major when you're in the G and B string zone. So would also be... Um, this uh moving on to major third so that's how that sounds you do want to know it this is important uh because this is so important with chords this is important to know like um this way up here where we got this a and this c up here <laughs> Oops, sorry. So like for a minor chord, minor seven. It's because it's got that minor chord in it. Or down here in this chord, it's because, can't believe I didn't write this, show the five string against this one. It's so important because five string here, major third, minor third. The major third is like the G chord that you know about here. You can see how you're playing a major third interval. Top, same with C, that same shape is here. When you get to the uh, string shift area, you have to straighten it out. All right, and when it comes to uh, chord thinking, it's here. Okay, those ring out because those were a series of uh, root major third root minor third in the correct order for the pattern of major and minor chords that develop out of the major scale. When you put those together, of course it sounds musical because it's the major scale. And you get to know that by knowing where your third interval is in relationship to the root um, for, with some good distance between them to give them a nice um, spacey harmony. All right, moving on to the fourth. Fourth is more ambiguous. I've just shaded it gray here, and we've got this. We'll keep in mind here that when we get to the fifth, there's a similarity in shapes, but it's about just focus on where is the root. The root is on the top. So we're so we're, if we focus on this as the root, then this becomes the four. Root, four. Oh, it's way farther away. Octave four. And this interval will be important to know. That's a four here. And that's why a chordal chord will sound the way it does. And we're talking about suspending chords. Lots of things we can go over. And we went over that in a longer lesson. So let's move on. The tritone row, it's so important here, but we're talking about seventh chords. When you start uh, hearing people talk about um, music that's moving to a seventh chord, um, the dominant seventh chord is actually what I mean. Um, where are these sevenths coming from? What What's the big thing that makes that dominant seventh chord? I'm hearing about this tritone is in the chord. Um, what are they talking about? It's this interval right here, and this is the pattern and the sound. As you can see, it's got the most um, jarring sound of all. It's the one tone that's directly in the middle of the octave. It splits the octave in the middle. 
So there's just a lot of lot of neat things, and they can go on and on about it, and I did in the longer lesson. <laughs> so we got to uh, move on, and you guys can get a uh, taste of what you need to know from there. A very, very important le um, interval in modern music that didn't always used to be uh, so important in different eras of music. Um, the five is really neat here. It looks like the four interval, but the root is different. So if we hear this chord to this chord, um, for example, kind of went from five to one, five, or from uh, one to five, one to five, one to five. All right, so um, playing in uh, the, with this five, you're dealing with uh, this is the interval responsible starting here or playing a chord here, or exemplifying this as the root is the um, going to be the mixolydian um, mode is implicated here. But um, so you can see here, it's the shell of a chord. It's the most stable notes. <laughs> You're typically going to play it like this power chord here, but it does also work straight up and down here. And that's the neat thing about this one. It kind of has that dual direction here. But uh, when it comes to a uh, one, three, five, you can see there's the one and the five. This is why the uh, a chord is one, three, five, because this one, five has got some of the best harmony of the interval series. The most stable harmony with the one. And because it's the most stable idea for the workers here that create the tonality of a chord. So down here, root and fifth. I'm going to go down here, get a better intonation. And we've got the um, a major third in there. We've got a minor third in there. Speaking of major minor third... They like to play together in chords. They're, it's very, if you use them wisely, you can create a lot of entertainment by playing with the thirds outside of uh, the standard um, teachings of uh, diatonic theory of what's going to be uh, inside a scale, you know, within the structure of a scale. And, you know, if you take that hard and fast, you don't get any fun things or any experimenting, then you're never going to be exposed to things like playing with the third. It's where the blues came from, and that flat five is also in the big time in the blues. It's the blue note in the, um, in the blue scale. The sharp five. There's so much about the sharp five we could go on and on and about, and I did in a longer lesson. So here it is. Doesn't sound great played like that, but it does sound good in a chord context. So once, you, like I said, once you get into these deeper intervals, you're going to talk mostly about these when people are talking to you about chords. And you want to start understanding complex harmony. You want to start talking anything about jazz. This is the uh, basics of what you need to... This is the foundation of what you need to do all that. Is to understand these um, implications of these intervals. And getting ideas about them. So that when you get ideas about them, they also become more memorable on your fretboard and in your mind. So there, uh, the flat fifth. So that sounds a little bit awkward on its own. Has a neat sound for a chord. Here's the regular chord, a minor chord. Really does some work there, that um, sharp five. Moving on, we've got the... Um, uh the six here cool really cool sounding chord 
-hmm. Also uses a tritone if you play it as a, a minor six chord with a you're at, we're adding in the flat third so. Mm -hmm. Just hear the sound. Uh, here I've got it elucidated in um, a scale shape. So we have this, uh, if your chord was here. And you wanted to add that six in. Hammer onto it or put it in the chord. Um, this is known as Dorian. If you were elucidate perhaps that B here I'm down on E and this is my sonic example here but on our fretboard here we're up in B and um, if you were to play the chord based on there it's the two chord of the scale um, in this series of notes here in this scale series constructed here um, it's a series of seven notes all the same even though they're jumbled around um, the uh, that would be a Dorian sound. There's also the chords here. We can get into harmony and the six harmony is really cool, but it's very similar to one three if you change the roots. That's why it works. And I'm out of frets. So, um, yeah, the six, really good interval to know for harmony. And the uh, flat seven here, moving on. Uh, flat seven is going to be for chords and jazz chords. And so important when it comes to um, time to make the uh, fifth chord really pull to the root, you're going to want to add in that seven for a whole bunch of reasons. That flat seven, actually. And that's going to be that um, part of that... Uh, flat seven um, or dominant chord we spoke of earlier when we were talking about the tritones. As you can see here, if we consider that a flat seven, if we add in a flat seven and a major third to a chord, we have a, um, a uh, tritone. So you can see if we had a root and then a flat seven and a third, that's where the tritone is created. Um, if we do the same thing with a root and then a six, well, actually the root would be here, then a six, and we would get a, uh, up here we would get the minor third or major third, then we have a six chord, which also the minor third has the tritone. So here it is. You've heard that a lot. Here's a major. Definitely some implications in uh, some jazz chord parts. Now, um, here it is with the uh, switching from a, set, a dominant chord to a six chord. I've heard this before. I think that, I think it's in a Beatles song. Moving on, we've got um, the major seventh, which kind of adds a great dimension. Here's a uh, to uh, when it comes to chords, really, because this is just another interval that really sounds like a half step. It is a half step, but the root is considered different. So if we had a it also uh, works as a pull this note always wants to pull to that one tends to always want to pull to the one if you had a um, a, uh, a minor uh, or a diminished chord something like that you could um, consider that as uh, pulling toward the one chord it adds a nice dimension to major chords uh, a nice mild quality I think also because this interval tends to um, be a little bit it's not very sta it's not very stable it's kind of tense it's kind of dissonant as a matter of fact this word I think that falling apart of consonants into dissonance 
is what kind of gives this chord, makes it, takes a major chord and makes it a little more tender. Hear this. Every romantic dance piece of the 50s. It's happy, but that note cries a little bit. These all sound happy together. Then that one kind of adds a unique shine, or maybe it's kind of whining against the other ones. I don't know, but it adds a glimmer to it. And the final interval, we we'll go over more in the long lesson. The finer, final uh, interval is the um, uh, octave. The octave, helping you navigate and get out of jams. When I need to find something, I'm like, oh, uh, but I need that note somewhere else. Or, uh, you know, I need this part I'm playing. Where is it? Boy, I want to move it up, but where is it exactly on this string? All I have to do is think about. Use that as my anchor note, find the octave. And I just have to know that on the, if I'm not covering the G to B string shift, then I'm um, in this nice geometric pattern here, skip a string, skip a fret. But if I am covering the uh, divide there, then I have to go one fret out. So it would be where, where this would be. This is now this because everything is shifted up to the uh, right. And that's our lesson. Um, hopefully uh, this is 15 or 20 minutes now compared to the um, uh, two-hour version that I hopefully you will watch. And um, if you found this anything about this interesting or uh, compelling, and um, please see the link below about buying me a coffee. But if not, the very least you can do is like and subscribe, and if you want to kick it up from there, watch the commercials all the way through. Let them play all the way through when you see this video, and um, uh, notify. Hit the notification bell so you get notified of all the new uh, lessons, which tend to be uh, uploaded uh, somewhat weekly, but not always. Um, thank you very much for watching, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Hopefully we'll watch that two-hour video. See it.